Hi, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show, the show for animal training and behavior nerds, where I, Ryan Cartledge, interview the world's most proficient animal training and behavior geeks. We're absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. So make sure you hit that subscribe button on whatever you're listening to this on so that you don't miss a single episode. Each episode of this show is brought to you on behalf of the ATA membership. And if you like the conversations in this episode, then you're invited to continue them with a like-minded behavior nerds within the membership area, which you can find out more about at www.animaltrainingacademy.com. You'll get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help problem solve your training challenges. Plus, we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forum areas. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. But we will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one Emily Johnson Vay. Emily works in the collaboration Carpe Momentum together with Ava Bertelson. Their goal is to help people acquire knowledge and skills in science-based, modern, humane and empowering teaching strategies for the benefit of learners of all species. Emily has experience from a variety of venues and has competed in various dog sports with several dogs of various breeds. Emily's goal is to make learning accessible, interesting and fun. Set up for success, break the skill down and make sure to ensure positive reinforcement, whether it has to do with teaching your dog to heal, yourself to get into a running regime, or helping your child learn to structure their homework. Emily studied to be a teacher in Swedish and English at Lund University. She writes fiction for adults and has published a series of children's books with some focus on positive reinforcement training. She also works as a translator and editor, reveling in finding ways to tell stories and make information available to a great many people. Together with Ava, she published a book you might all be familiar with, Agility Right From The Start, way back in 2010, nearly 11 or 11 years ago. Uh, Emily has been a part of the Clicker Expo faculty for many years, teaching together with Ava. E and E also introduced Tag Teach to Scandinavia in 2005, and we're the first European Tag Teach faculty. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Emily to the show today. She's patiently waiting by in Sweden. Emily, it's your evening there. Thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to come and hang out with us at Animal Training Academy. Yay, finally. I'm so happy to be here. I've been looking forward pumped, to this. Pumped. 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 You've, you've made time. I've, I read your bio uh, before, obviously, recording today but as I was reading again then I was like wow like that is a lot of things well, I guess <laughs> I guess that's kind of me I like a lot of things uh, I uh, I like to do many different things I normally tell people that my little company stands on many legs and that no day is the same it might be in a I might be in a meeting with Eva for five hours on a Monday and then doing things on my own and then I might be talking to parents about something on the Tuesday and on the Wednesday I might be teaching people to run and on the Thursday I might be standing in a stables and on a Friday I might be editing a book. You never know. It sounds enriching. Yes. I know that we have members doing your running program at the moment. Yes. And all, all of these parts of your life um, uh, are intertwining with like behavior being an umbrella. Yes, for Does sure. That, yeah. Which is kind of what we want to talk about today. Later We're going to talk about because... everything. <laughs> <laughs> The meaning of life, everyone. Here it comes from <laughs> Emily and Ryan. But yeah. what we like to do in this podcast, Emily, as you know, is learn a little bit about our guests, learn a little bit about what uh, created 2021 Emily Johnson Vay. 
Uh, and, and I'm curious to get started, if you could take the listeners back to the start of your journey where you first started learning about animal training, about positive reinforcement and uh, share with us, as, as you mentioned in your bio you sent me, um, some stories that you love to tell. I'm a big fan of stories as well. Share with us some stories from your behavioral odyssey. Well, so I'm the girl who never got a pony. Uh, I started out horseback riding as a young girl. And where I live in Sweden, it's you, you go to a riding school. And then if you're lucky and if your parents have money, you might get your own pony. And I wasn't lucky and my parents did not have the money, so I did not get the pony. Uh, however, I had a, neighbors, I had a neighbor whose mum was involved with the local dog club. And she was also the dog sitter of a Labrador called Kiki. And the funny story here is, which I actually published in one of my children's books, like I kind of wrote my story, but not really, you know, the used parts of my own life kind of thing. This dog that she was uh, dog sitting, she would be left in the mornings by a young man with long hair and a um, leather jacket. And I was dead terrified of him because he looked really scary. And I was terrified of the dog. Uh, she would run through the street and she was all friendly, but I was terrified of her. And I was terrified of, of my neighbor's two big German shepherds as well. But her daughter was a friend of mine and in some way I kind of got used to the dogs. And then when my parents wouldn't buy me that final pony that I had helped train, um, I got really sad and I cried for a couple of weeks as teenage girls do. And then I put together my pocket money and I said, I want to do a dog course. And I got to borrow this dog that I was so afraid of. Uh, and she became such a friend to me. And we had so much fun with the local dog club. I, I, I still think back to those days every once in a while of how we just pile like, a, I don't know how many kids and their dogs into like a bus and drive 60 S Swedish miles, which is what, 600 kilometers uh, up to our capital and go to dog shows. And there were like dogs and kids everywhere. And there were no space for nobody. And it, it, But everything, everybody was fine. And we had a lovely time and we'd go canoeing and I don't know what. And then like two years after this happened, I saved up my pocket money again and I bought my first own dog. My parents were not animal people, but they were gracious enough to just kind of let me do my thing. Uh, my mother was a geneticist and she taught me to speak Latin at a young age. I don't remember much, but she was like very interested in things, but not an animal person. And I bought my first dog. This is in 1990. So it's when the dinosaurs ro roamed the earth. Um, and this was not positive reinforcement training. Um, I would just for, for the audience that's not Swedish, which I, which I guess is most of the people, uh, I don't think Sweden was ever... I don't want to, I was trying to, to use a not label -y. Um The coercive training that we saw here was still kind of mild coercive training. So it was like correction based, but not the worst corrections you can think of. So you'd see leash pops and you might see people grabbing their dog by the scruff, but there would be no electrical collars, no of the pinching collars, not, nothing like that. But still, that's the way I started out in dog training. It was just completely, you know, leash pop and everything. I didn't really like that, but I didn't know any other way. And But then this puppy that I bought, she was a mixed breed between Labrador, Golden and German Shepherd. And with a labely word, she would be uh, labeled soft. But she would like go over into some sort of, everything got too much to her. If I told her off, she would like be Wah! like this. And we had a very, very troubling first year. So I'm 14 at this time. Uh, and we had a really troubling first year and people were starting to tell me, this is not going to work, Emily. You're going to have to rehome or put her down. And I was like, nope. And I decided not to go to the dog club for a couple of weeks. And I just like, we just went on walks and I was thinking about how can this work? And I, I don't actually remember what I did, but I changed my way of being around her. And after about three months after the, the, the big disasters, we were on a different track. And Nilla was her name. And you can actually see her, Ryan, because you can see her behind me. Uh, she, uh, she was my best friend and we competed in agility and obedience all over Sweden. We traveled with buses. My parents didn't have a car. Um, it, was, it was great. And then in 1994, my younger sister, Joanna, bought a border terrier called Flux after the flower. She was the toughest border terrier you've ever seen. She wanted to hunt like you would never believe. And all of a sudden, I became aware that even with Nilla, there were still uh, corrections. Just because I didn't need to pop the leash, there was still the clearing of my throat. There were still little things going on. 
But with the Border Terrier, I could clear my throat until next week. She wouldn't care. And it became very, very clear that they're over aversive. And I wasn't comfortable with this. And this is when I found Anders Hallgren and read the first book on shaping that was written in Swedish. He was very early. And then I got my hands on Don't Shoot the Dog a couple of years into this. And then in 98, when I bought my first own Border Terrier, Mu, I trained her with positive reinforcement as well as I could from the beginning. And this is also the beginning of my marriage to Eva. Because uh, we had young dogs at the same time and we were competing in agility with both our uh, older dogs and starting the puppies out. And here in Sweden at that time, we'd have full weeks in the summer where everybody would stay in like tents and cabins and stuff. And we were competing all day in the sun. And then in the evenings, we would play cards and talk about agility training. And Eva and I would talk about agility training into the level of detail that nobody else could stand us. And they would literally leave the room. And we were just, I mean, I still remember the high of finding somebody who just wanted to talk about the details and kind of figure it out and tease out. So if I do this, what does that mean, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the beginning of everything. And after that, um, I've like never looked back. So this is from 98 until now. I like that. That was the beginning of everything. <laughs> <laughs> it was. I didn't realize there was Nyla behind you. Yeah. What do, what do you, when you look at, is that a photo or a drawing? It's a photo. Yeah. When you look at that photo now, what, mm -hmm. what do you think? Like what, what, is there a reason you have it there? Is it like just warm fuzzies or is, is it memories and remindings of? It's mostly warm fuzzies. She was with me from being a child until I was a married adult with a baby. My first child, Samuel, was born in 2002 and Nilla lived into 2003. And she loved my baby. She was the best dog around the baby ever. So she kind of carried me from childhood into adulthood. So she means the world to me. And everybody who met me uh, as a teenager will remember Nilla as well because she was always with me. She came everywhere. Um, and she, she, she literally felt like, a, like, like just like a really great partner. It's pretty special. Very special. You said in 1998 when, mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't say how old I was in 1998, that never makes anyone feel good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but in 1998 was the beginning of everything. What is, what is, what is everything? What happened after 1998? You read Don't Shoot the Dog. Yeah, just before you... that. And I met Eva and agility was like my life. Uh, I mean, literally, we did everything. Everything that Eva and I have done after that, we always come back and say, well, from agility, we learned. So a lot of the stuff that we will talk about when, I mean, you've talked to Eva about flowcharts, um, whatever. All of these things, uh, the, the questions, who does what when, what does that look like? All of that kind of stems from the agility training because agility is fast paced and it needs to be fast paced. You want it to be competitive. It, that's what we wanted at that time. And that meant that we really had to tease out, out all these details. So literally it was the start of everything um, in the sense that Eva and I started out being e e the shared brain, um, and I started out learning more about behavior, uh, what it works. And, and I started becoming an adult. I met my husband in 19, my becoming he, the man who became my husband. I met him in 97. Uh, we got married in 2001. I brought Eva on the honeymoon, or rather I brought Anders to the Agility World Cup for the honeymoon. Uh, <laughs> and people always laugh when I say that, but it's true. Eva and Anders like each other a lot. They'll discuss maths whenever they get together and I'll just shut my ears and go do something else because that would be one area that perhaps my brain doesn't really um, do cartwheels. Um, and what else? It's the beginning of, it, it is truly the beginning of everything. I started to become, a, I guess you would call it high school teacher, upper secondary school teacher in Swedish and English. Uh, and I enjoyed uh, doing that. Um, I wrote my final paper on tag teach. If they could have failed me for being a behaviorist, they would have. I had a big sharing session with Eva after that one because I was so upset. Um, and we got in to talk about tag teach in 2005. Uh, and that kind of opened up a whole new way of thinking because we were very aware that we had teased apart the parts of agility training. We knew the details. We knew how to break it down for the dog, blah, blah, blah. But the person, it was very much force feeding. You know, we have all this information. We wanted to give everybody our best. And it was a little bit like, I don't know, 
nasty making foie gras, just pushing information into people. Um, and it was great. Eva surfed the internet and she found Beth Wheeler and Teresa McKeon. And she invited them over to Sweden. And Teresa had a horrible, uh, <laughs> horrible experience with Swedish pizza. You can ask her about that at some point. Uh, she was like, what is this? And a horrible experience with the Swedish washing machine, because in the US, the washing machine doesn't take so long. But in Sweden, if you do it like the eco-friendly type, it could be an hour and a half or maybe two hours. And when we came back, Teresa was literally in tears going, it's eating my clothes um but anyway we learned about tag teach and started to focus more on the like the human aspect of what we were doing when we were teaching people um and that was fascinating and then i had my second child in 2007 and that was in it's always interesting to kind of bring a new life into a, a family and what what you've learned s- since you had the first baby etc and how many dogs do you have in the household and what's going on there And I never got to work as a school teacher because Eva and I started Carpa Momentum and we started traveling out in the world and teaching. And we we got on Karen Pryor's um, Clicker Expo faculty and we wrote the book for Karen that actually came from Teresa again, visiting Sweden for the Tag Teach seminar. She was like, but have you written anything in English that I can read? And we were like, hmm, yes, we've written an article for Clean Run, the agility magazine, and it's about noise and movement training for the Tita. This is where we first introduced the concept of start buttons that is now roaming the earth. Uh, not that it's us that invented it, but that's the first instance that we wrote about it. And so Teresa wrote that, uh, read that, and then she showed it to Karen Pryor. And then these two Swedish girls got an email from Karen saying, so would you like to write me an agility book? And we were like, for sure. And we we're like almost done in our opinion. We had already started. And then it took another seven years for us to write that um, book that too long to write in the Bible. Uh, and, but that was, that was fun. And that was published in 2010, as you said. And in 2010, I lost my mother. She lived through just, the book was published in May. My mother passed away in November. Um, and what else happened? Then in 2013, I had my third child, last child, because, of, because, because three is enough and I'm old. Um, and yeah, I think that's basically it. Sorry about your mum. Yeah, that was sad. Oh, I didn't know about washing machines and Swedish pizza, but <laughs> what I like about being nearly 150 episodes deep is all these little pieces of the puzzle just between this uh, current pile of knowledge we have in 21 and 2021 and how we got here. You know, the the pizza and, and the washing machine, I'm sure, are an important part of <laughs> where we are in 2021. For sure, because Teresa McKeon and I became friends over the nasty pizza and the washing machine, and that of course yeah. has influenced me. So yes, ah, I love it. I love. It. One day <laughs> I'm gonna have to like get all the podcast episodes and just like piece the actual story together from like start to finish. Yeah. It's gonna be a jumble. It's gonna take probably seven plus years as well, but <laughs> that'll be a fun thing to listen to. One thing, look, I think the world needs to know about E and E. That's Ryan's opinion. Uh, what you guys do with regards to breaking stuff down the flowchart uh, and and communicating and teaching start buttons, I think uh, is is and, and and going back to your bio, you said you wanted to make learning accessible, interesting, and fun. From my perspective, you've done that, like because because uh, flowcharts and and learning about start buttons, like. I, I, I'm so fascinated about what I'm going to be saying in 10 years because, you know, when I learned about those things, I was like, what have I been doing my entire life? <laughs> like, you know, what, what, how, how, do you, how do you think about this now? Like if you want to teach a new concept, how do you think about everything you've learned about teaching now and how to take this new concept to our um, knowledge-hungry <laughs> industry? Uh, how do you yeah. make it accessible, interesting, and fun? I think that's a really, really interesting question. And also what you said about not being able to to kind of grasp how the heck did I do it before? And there's a lot of things that I go, but I don't know how you would do it if you did it otherwise. Uh, what I try to do, if, if, if we talk about the accessible part, what I try to do is make sure to explain and to talk and to be in a world with people that normally don't talk the talk and walk the walk because that makes it makes me kind of understand where other people are coming from if i i mean after i've spent a week just talking to eva having long meetings my brain is like buzzing and i am so energized and i'm so happy and our conversations our rants it's like oh i love it 
but it's a little bit um, maybe not attuned to the world because Eva and I are so, I mean, I literally start a sentence and she'll, she'll finish it. Not before, when we used to share hotel rooms, what would happen is that we'd come up after teaching and we'd both be really jazzed and we'd be blah, 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 blah. And then one of us would get tired, and, but one of us is still talking. And the one that's tired would fall asleep. The other one is still talking. Uh, the one that fell asleep will sleep for a bit, then wake up. And the other one is still talking. And the one that was sleeping will now take over and the other one will fall asleep. And then from all of this, there would be great notes. And we'll come up with like the list of priorities or what we call uh, um, the, the taken mistake, the, the cake, whatever. So that's like just a wow experience. But for me to make learning accessible and fun, I need that because that challenges my thinking and comes, makes me come up with new things. But I also need to just hang out and look at what are people doing right now and how can I explain and approximate, how can I get them with me from where they are? And are there points in what they're already doing that I might need to incorporate just because I wouldn't do it doesn't mean it's wrong. And how can I make it accessible? And also having three kids helps uh, because I need to explain things to them. Them, they're also relating to my dogs, for example. And every time I put something in writing or every time I put together a course, like Eva and I put together two big online courses uh, for Tromplo, both on, on start buttons and on seamlessness training, then you have to kind of tease out, is there an order to this, in which which is the logical order for for somebody to be able to do number four? What 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 do they need to know beforehand, and what are kind of the outliers? What 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 do I need to bring in? Where are their mechanical skills that I need to find? Where is it not about dog training, but about people training? Which is, I mean, the six. I think Eva and you did you and Eva discuss the six point list? Where you always think that. Uh, when we talk about animal training, we have a tendency to focus on the animal part. This is the goal for the animal. This is how I'm going to train it. And then you go train it. On a good day, those are the three steps. But literally, those three steps, yes, they are important. But what is the goal for the trainer? What is the trainer going to do? How is the trainer going to learn to do that and train the trainer? And then you get to train the animal. Uh, so the six-point list will incorporate a lot of the uh, the trainer skills. And I think having to think about that when I'm teaching somebody else makes it more accessible because you have to be able to do it. There's a huge difference between knowing and doing. And we have a tendency to muddle them up and thinking just because I read this and I understand it, I can do it. Well, nope. It's uh, what you're saying is, is um, mixing in my brain with conversations currently happening in the ATA uh, Facebook group where I asked, um, following on from a recommendation from Veronica Patelli, what our members' two biggest problems were. Uh, and a recurring theme was uh, analysis, no, paralysis, sorry. I by analysis, two words. yes. Paralysis mm. by analysis. And I've kind of approximated my, my training along where I just, I don't, I don't think too much because that will stop me from doing things. And, and, mm -hmm. And I see space for flowcharts to kind of really jump in and, and assist here and um, six your six point list, point which list. is what you guys what you, you you did a presentation on that clicker expo. Is that correct? Yes, we did. So what, one other thing that I've been doing recently, <laughs> this is going to uh, end with a question that I really want to get your input on. Uh, one reason I really want to get your input on it is because I asked our members what their problems were, and this is one of their problems. And I'm, so I'm seeing an opportunity to inject some information that is relevant to what people are saying. They're, they're stuck on at the moment. Um, one thing that Veronica has asked me to do, Veronica Patelli from Dogbiz, for anyone that doesn't know, she's helping me out with the business side of Animal Training Academy, is scheduling. And so I will schedule my training. I have half an hour here. right? I, I get in and I... Um, review my notes from my last session. I'll do some short sessions with uh, my learner and then I'll come out and I'll use a rubric that Sarah Owings created to kind of analyse my training. And, and I kind of have allotted over the last few months 30 minutes for that. And like I'm rushing <laughs> like to the point that it's detrimental, I think, at times to actually um, doing good training because – I'm not allowing myself space uh, to to implement well. Um, how, how how does <laughs> limited resources, um, paralysis of analysis, uh, and the tools that you're talking about um, come together to to help trainers train? <laughs> right. That is a great question. 
And oh, there are so many, um, so many roads into talking about this. Can I just, before we kind of go into how, how to solve things and maybe some fluffy things, can I just make a point first? So a lot of the things that I might say during this podcast onwards, I just want to make the, the different, I want to differentiate between system and individual. So when we talk about a lot of fluffy things and maybe proverbs and quotes and whatnot, those are interesting on an individual level for somebody to like make their own and do something with, ask questions for and actually make something of a behavior, an action point, something they can do. On a system level, I am not very fond or I am very cautious of bringing them into that. First of all, because sometimes when we use a lot of fluff, it might not be scientifically correct. And then if we use that as a base to build a system on, then that's false. And I don't want that. Um, and I also don't want a system like a societal system that puts too much uh, pressure on the individual. Something is for the societal system to sort out, uh, and that should not be mixed up with the, with the individual system. This will make sense in a little while when we keep talking, and I will tell you what I, what I mean by that. But I just wanted to have that out there because that's important to me. But looking at analysis by paralysis, paralysis by analysis, why can't I get that right ever? Paralysis by analysis and how to manage your time and then actually get good training done. So here's, here's, I think, the crux. I think the crux is that at some point, you are going to need to set aside some form of time to get some of the tools that has to do with your mechanics and maybe your planning just kind of set, just to take the time and give you that like um, space and that grace that you would give your learner. We are really, really bad at as, as a whole, as a group, I think we're generally bad at being as good to ourselves as we are to our learners. Good being operationalized as actually building behavior, maintaining behavior, implementing reinforces, etc. Um, and I was just telling you before we got on the podcast that I read something today about Solomon's paradox which is normally what we would say about backseat training, uh, that how easy it is to help somebody. It's easy for me to talk to you about your issue and set you up with some things, but then sort out my own procrastination with my uh, bookkeeping for my accountant. Totally different ballgame because I'm a different species and it doesn't apply to me. Um, and even when we know all of this, and I sometimes think that, think that knowing it is kind of what brings on the paralysis by analysis, because we know that there are things that we should do, and should is not always a friendly thing. Um, so the question is, and this is going to be different, I would say what Ken Ramirez says, it depends. Uh, it's going to depend on the specific individual, the specific trainer, what kind of time, what is it you need to set aside time for. But I do think that in general, in every person's life, there needs to be time for reflection. And that has to do with your training. It has to do with your life with your partner, life with your kids, life with your work, whatever. So just to get it out there, that there's, there's not going to be a magical formula that's going to sort it out but that you need to kind of find some way to implement. I have Kathy's book next to me and it says grace. And it's in a, in a way, it is grace. Grace for yourself to, to take out the time to fix that mechanics or whatever. People will ask me and Eva about flowcharts and they will say, but how do you have the time? So it's not that I flowchart everything. I will flowchart now when it's like in my system and I know how to do it quickly. For the first of all, I can flowchart in my head, just going who does what when and I kind of see the errors and I can see it like a very like almost alien thing just growing out like this because I've made so many flowcharts. But also if I'm working on something like Tessa's grab and hold that proved to be a much bigger challenge than I thought, then I will take the time to sit down with the flow chart. And it might be something else has to give that day. There's something again in the, in the concept of grace, just understanding that a day is, these are the amount of hours you have. And these are the amount of hours that you have to work with. And there are the children and there are the husband and there's the older dog and there's the house that needs to be cleaned. And there's the work that you put on. These are not going to go away. But if you look at them like pieces of cake, you, you can kind of work them around. But this is something that you need to take the time with. And yeah, jump in anytime, Ryan, because I'm like, I'm, I'm, there are so many, there are so many little, little different things here. But I do think that carving out time 
just for reflection and then carving out time for the things that you feel that I just need to, to be able to do this a little bit better. Choose one thing and do that. And as you said before, don't get stuck. It doesn't need to be perfect. It's never interesting. Go out and do something. As long as you're training within a uh, positive, um, positive reinforcement paradigm, nothing is go- nothing is going to break. It might, might not be the best thing you've ever trained, but at least you're training. If you're just sitting there staring at the flow chart you're not making or the bullet journal that with all the lovely colors, uh, then not much is going to happen, not for your learner and not for you. So yeah, I don't have a magic answer, but I do think that it has to do with grace. It has to do with understanding that reflection needs place in your calendar. And it has to do with looking at yourself as a learner and not just a trainer. <clears throat> you said perfect is, is boring. And I'm reminded of a quote that Chris Varnon shared with me from Adventure Time. It says, dude, sucking at something is the first step to being sort of good at something uh and that, and that's why i that's why i liked your 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 e and e's flow chart so much is because it gave me permission to not be perfect yes because one thing ava taught me is that when you're trying to figure out what to do if your learner doesn't do what you want or doesn't do what you expect to not be perfect just do something that you can do quickly and easily and kind of implement uh, is, do you think that that's part of that you said perfection is boring do you think that part of analysis uh, I'm do it as well paralysis, paralysis of analysis <laughs> yeah. is that people are pausing because they want to be perfect I do think is so that, and, I, and I believe perfection is an illusion uh, so uh, I, I believe in, in doing my best and as, as you just said if you have a plan for what if my learner doesn't do what I expected. At least you've thought about it and at least you've got a way to get out of there. That's not adding insult to injury. That's all I'm asking for. I do not care if it's perfect, but this is your way of getting out of there without loading anything more into the situation that's, that you're going to have to deal with later. I, I coined a quote for the, our upcoming presentation on the Lemonade, Lemonade conferences and said that error handling can be the curse that works forwards. Because if you do add insult to injury, then that, that error is going to bite you uh, <laughs> over and over again. So for me to just have a way, it doesn't have to be the perfect way, but it can be a way. And if you then find like two months down the road that you, oh, but this would be better, then change it. It's not set in stone. You can you can change it. So if, if you find a better way of getting out of sticker situations, then use that. But for the time being, use what you figured out and get good at using that one so it's fluent and just make sure that you have somewhere to go and that your learner has somewhere to go for the next reinforcer, then you're all good. When I asked that question, what are your two biggest challenges? Bob Simmons, if you're listening to this, said he just wants to download people's brains. That That is his problem. He can't do that. So I wish we could download that that thought process into people's brains. Yes. I'm curious to get your thought on, on one more thing to do with this. I know we haven't talked about anything we said we are going to talk about, but part, part of my journey as well is because because I'm like had such a big shift from meeting everyone that I've met during this, doing this podcast in my training. Uh, you know, I just want to share it with everyone, but I'm I'm so conscious that uh, my journey might not be what the approximation that is needed for another learner. So I'm conscious, I'm cautious of always just sharing, oversharing before kind of learning where people are at as an ind- individuals to the best of my ability. I'm not always. Uh, great at that but doing this 30 minute a day thing doing flow charting when needed uh and and using my system that works for me which is sarah owings rubric <clears throat> one thing i found is that when i say and, and i love that word grace uh, and thank you for reminding us of that and, and it's use in plenty and life is free uh, by kathy sadeo uh one, one one part of my definition of my training is not so great when i'm limited in resources uh is that like the the whole point of working in with a rubric that I tell people is like you don't have to, to be, deal with frustration because there's always something to celebrate because uh, you've tried something different so celebrate that you now have more information uh, and then base your next decision but then I'm like I felt frustrated after that session mm-hmm. but frustration but not in a punishing way because I trained the next day not punishing or with regards to the behaviors of training. So I'm in this position where I'm like listening to people saying we have paralysis of analysis, click. And I'm like, do this thing, knowing that people might get frustrated, right? Yeah. But knowing it's not punishing for me. Mm-hmm. Well, how did, well first, of all, first of all, 
I think that every time you share something, you are very, very conscious of like saying, so this worked for me. And then people will have to take their own responsibility of the fact that they're not you and can't download your brain. When it comes to the whole limited resources and making training work for you, I have a few ideas on that one. Uh, So one is, if you can set the training up in a way that the learner is expecting the training. So for example, I train in the morning. If you follow me on Instagram, you've seen my pajama sessions, uh, which means that I don't even bother getting dressed and you get hair all over the place and whatever. But I still train and I share my training. And this is always before the dog's breakfast. And what I can tell, so my dogs, they will go to station without me asking them to. They're like, they're ready to train. They're like, they are like there already so like half of uh, uh, battle is the completely wrong word but I'm halfway there already with them being I'm expecting it and they're expecting it which makes me a better trainer like just by that as opposed to if I would have tried to push in 10 minutes of training something with Tessa just before jumping on the call with you now that's not a time that I normally train that's a time I normally put my child to bed that would make me less on top of my game and my dog is not expecting anything either so perhaps a little bit you can take like a little cheaty route in by creating a structure where both you and your learner are expecting training also just make perhaps a system of a quick little check-in with yourself before you start so ryan are you on a one to ten are we feeling ryan-ish are we on a two or an eight i'm on a two today i am going to work on something that i know really well and that my learner does and we're just going to do it together to kind of strengthen our relationship and get in a few a little session of a little something because it's a thing we do Uh, But on a day when you feel like I am Ryan 8, Ryan 9, Ryan 10, that's the time you bring out the big guns and you start a new project or something, but kind of check in before. It's the same way that I check in with my dogs if I take them to a new place or I'm um, introducing a new reward procedure into something, then I will try out the reward procedure before I train because in case it doesn't work, I don't want to be standing there saying, oh, yay, tug, and the dog goes, oh, what? Um, And the same way, check in with yourself. Where are you today? What's going on? Is your head with you? Is the child screaming or head off in the next room are you did you have a fight for your spouse in the morning and are you really not feeling it do something easy what else do I have up my sleeve when it comes to that well just do something fun I mean the the I actually it's 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 silly but the whole pajama session thing when people go oh I love that robe I have a robe with blue birds on it and apparently it's the best thing that's happened to the dog training community in a long time because the the amounts of uh, <laughs> messages I get on the robe are more than I get on the training um but still and that kind of makes me happy brings a smile to my face I mean how many pairs of woolen socks my hair all over the places. Can I post on the internet? Well, apparently a lot of them. And that kind of brings a smile to my face. And that takes a little bit of the seriousness out. And on a general day, I just think, just kind of remember, you're not solving world peace. You're not solving the climate crisis. You're training your dog. And it's a decision that you made because it's fun. Or you're training your parrot, whatever you're training, but you get the gist of that. It's like sometimes I feel that paralysis by analysis, tack, um, it comes also from, it's like when we get like goldfishy in our perspective, like it's, it's, it's the entire thing. If I start to feel that anything is the entire thing, I'm going to go do something else because that's not healthy for me. Nothing is that important. There's very few things that are that important. Um, have fun. And I know that, that that was a stupid thing to say, Emily, because one of the things that I hate the most is that when somebody, so story, can I tell a story? So my son, uh, he goes to his teacher, they were going to do the high jump in his, uh, in his uh, PE lesson, his, uh, in his uh, gym lesson. And at this time, my son was short. And when he's, they said he was going to do the high jump, he came home and he was really worried about the high jump. because, like, I can't jump that high. I, I don't know how to do it, whatever. And I told him, so, so and we had a little discussion and he kind of came up with, but I can go ask my teacher for one detail to focus on. My kids have been, uh, they know about tag teach. So they were like, I'll go and ask for one detail to focus on. And he goes down and he explains his concerns to his teacher and said, can you just give me one thing to focus on? And his teacher said, oh, don't worry. This is just for fun. It doesn't matter. I normally do not storm down to my kids' schools and tell their teachers off, but this might been, have been one of those times when I divulged information in perhaps not the kindest Emily voice. Uh, because that that is actually rude and not taking somebody, somebody's trying to make something 
something. It's trying to look at behavior in the way that we're trying to, to say that it matters. This is the way that you can to do something about it. If you want to change behavior, then you focus on one detail and you get feedback on that detail. And then you tell them, oh, it's just for fun. But so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say, look at all these different options you have and look at your why and try to figure out what's lacking. Is there something in it that has to do with your mechanics? Fix it. Is it something to do that has to do with the uh, time of day? Fix it. Is it something to do with your schedule, scheduling? That's just like, you are not being realistic. Well, look at that with grace. I am not, because again, I think paralysis by analysis comes from, we are beating ourselves up in a way that we would never do it to our learners ever. We would never do that. So I think just step out, look at it and like, what do I need? What are the skills that I don't have and how do I build them? And get curious. I like curiosity. Curious is a word we don't use enough. Instead of going all like stiff and paralysis by analysis, get curious. What is this? Why? Why? What does this look like? What can I do it's, about it? Um, I, I like that. Uh, the, the, uh, there you are, everyone. If, if you don't know whether you try and ask yourself the question, are you feeling, how Ryanish are you feeling today? <laughs> I, I, and I like that uh, story that you shared, uh, and 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 how insulting that is to someone who is is asking for help. Um, and I'm I'm viewing my uh, frustration now, and 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 kind of have like the devil on one shoulder and, and an angel on the other. Mm-hmm. Uh, and 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 the devil's like, yo, Ryan, like this is bad. Like, you don't want to feel like this, man. Like, <laughs> don't do things. And the angel's like, hey, Ryan, you're closer now. You're closer to your to what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. And, like, so, like, I'm kind of like, oh, well, maybe I should just train to be frustrated because, mm-hmm. cause, because I know when I'm frustrated, I'm, like, pushing myself and I, I know that I'm going to get there. Like there's, there's very few things where like if I don't try and keep trying and keep changing, like we get the result. But then I'm like, but what about errorless learning? Like, <laughs> why do you? Can, have to but can I can I can I ask about a, a thing? Yeah, let's, yeah, yeah. Let's, go, let's let's talk go. about let's talk about fluff from this. What about yes. changing the perspective? Why are we choosing the label of frustration? Okay. Well, why 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 aren't we why why aren't you labeling that as curiosity? Why is that frustration? Because you say it doesn't make you feel bad. It doesn't make you not do it. it, it well, that's that's the that's the paradox. Like it doesn't feel nice, right? But mm-hmm. it's also somewhere where I live. Mm-hmm. Because so you reframe it as curiosity. Wow. Or something. I mean, just no, curiosity is great. I, I think that sometimes when we stand there, this is not the best uh, best um, example I'm going to give all this evening, but I'll say it anyway. So a couple of years back, so I work from home, not just during the pandemic, I work from home. That's kind of what I do um, when I'm not traveling. And I have a schedule for cleaning because since I'm home all the time and I've got three kids and two dogs, cleaning is a thing. And I could clean all day, every day, and it would still be uh, needed, but I can't do that because I have work to do. So on Mondays, I clean the bathrooms. On Tuesdays, I clean the kitchen on Wednesday I vacuum clean on Thursdays I do like dusting and picking up things and on Fridays I just make things look nice and smell nice uh, and on Saturdays I do nothing and on Sundays I vacuum clean again so one Monday I was cleaning one of the bathrooms and I was feeling particularly sorry for myself because it's not it was not at that point one of my favorite um, things to do and then I was like Emily what the why I mean if, if are you going to feel like this every Monday and the point of that would be what you have no point in that you have decisions to make do you want to live in a house with two bathrooms yes I kind of do do you want to pay for somebody else to clean your house no I kind of don't for many reasons first of all I don't have no, not first of all first of all I really don't want to because I want to uh, I, I, I believe personal belief has nothing to do with data or science personal belief is that I need to take I need to be close to my own survival I need to take care of myself I don't want other people doing things that is that is like basic things that are for me. So I don't want somebody else to clean my house. Okay, just sit with that for two seconds, Emily, and then just realize that you want the two bathrooms. And there we go. Go clean your bathrooms and be grateful. And actually, just reframe, just having a little think, a little reflection on why you're you actually, you're actually really lucky to have the two bathrooms in the house that you love, that used to be your grandparents. What are you bitching about? Stop that. 
uh, and I mean, it's not me being hard on myself. It's, it's just a little, just think about it. Instead of this like everyday bitch and moan that you, that people can kind of get into, I can get into just like a general feeling sorry for myself for things that I, I don't know why I'm feeling sorry for myself about them. And then when you kind of look at them go, but, oh, I actually want them. Uh, okay. Oh yeah. And then you go clean the bathrooms and it will get. I sometimes think that it has to do with this as well. Instead of labeling what you're going through in this process as, as frustration, choose another label and see what happens. I might be dead wrong and you might be frustrated in all the behaviors that we put in under frustration. And then we'll just have to relabel it again. But I mean, the worst thing that happens is that you perhaps you feel curious. Well, I think you've changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, and this is again what I wanted to say before about the difference between systems and individuals. In Sweden, we have a saying that says det är inte hur man har det, utan hur man tar det. It's not what's happening to you, it's how you are reacting to it. And I think that's true on an individual level. Society cannot lean on that. And that's why I, I really want to make that distinction. To me, that's important. Well, I love it. Looking at the time, we've talked a lot about fluffy things today <laughs> we've, yeah. we've used the word fluff and then the audience aren't used to that word in this episode and we haven't really that was intentional everyone <laughs> we're like let's talk about fluffy things today and emily told me that uh, she loves the fluffy uh, but i'm but i'm assuming the audience of this podcast <laughs> might be having many thoughts and one of those thoughts might be what is fluff what what does fluff look like because that, that's how we operate, right? We spend years learning about applied behavior analysis. Uh, and what's so beautiful about this is we can use that knowledge to navigate our world. Uh, and, and it can become challenging at times to view the world through any lens but a behavior lens. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, we recently did some podcast episodes on the growth mindset, which is kind of very relevant to the things we've just discussed on this episode today. Uh, and, and following this as, as a membership, ATA members did a book club on this. And I remember when we started, some of the posts in our Facebook group, there were comments like, what does a growth mindset look like? What are the reinforcers for these undefined behaviors? And how do we set up our antecedents for success, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I got worried at the start that maybe this wasn't a good pick for a book club in ATA. Maybe it was too... Fluffy. <laughs> However, our amazing book club coordinator, David Thatcher, thank you, David, posted week after week, chapter after chapter, and I feel like I saw less and less of those comments replaced by what I would label as more personal reflections and, and insights into how the ideas could be helpful. Uh, and I've had many people since tell me how valuable our content on the growth mindset has been. And this made me think about the challenges of, of just, and this is something that you and I talked about a couple of weeks ago, Emily, the challenges of just listening and reading without doing so through the filter of our animal training and behavior selves, which is like really hard to do sometimes. <laughs> so Emily, this is my understanding of what we are talking about when we're talking about fluff, if I've even made sense. Yeah. Is, is, is there value in removing our behavior classes from time to time more regularly. How do we do this? Is this a waste of time? Are there times, I've got lots of questions. Are there times yeah, so, when so I think I see it less as removing my behavioral glasses, if you want to see it like that, as to more of listening and observing the way that I do with other behavior. I'm, I'm, I'm just doing this event series with the Chirag, Hannah and Eva. Uh, we call it behind the scenes. So we're, we wanted to, to uh, make a deep dive into how do you observe? How do you focus your eye and your mind? And I think we talked about that, about how to draw something without like a preconceived notion of what you're trying, et cetera, et cetera. All of that I think that sometimes through our behavioral glasses, we start asking questions a little bit too soon before we have observed everything. That's one, that's one in on why I think the fluff is important. It broadens my way of listening and, and watching. Another reason why I think that fluff uh, is valuable is that we are, we've been discussing a lot in, in the animal training community that we need to embrace and invite in people that are coming from different walks of, of training. Maybe they have been using aversive methods, but they are now curious of, of what this looks like. If I am to say that self-help is bad, fluff is bad, that is as bad as closing the door to a trainer that wants to learn about positive reinforcement, but is currently using a choke chain. Why? I, I don't see that I have the mandate to do that. That's not helping anybody. 
Uh, and for me, again, to take part in, and listen and to read some of this stuff that might be deemed fluffy, it also makes it easier for me to meet the learners that I meet and understand what they are talking about. I am also really, really curious as to why some of these self help uh, fluffy things, why they fly so high, while a lot of the stuff that we are talking about are just under the radar. It's, it never breaks through. What is the pull from the way of speaking and labeling the way that they do? They, I just said they, I don't mean they, that's done in that kind of material. Let's rephrase it like that. It's not an us, they thing. That was a careless use of words. Uh, what what is the pull from that, and why isn't why what are what, what I am not explaining? What am I not explaining to somebody uh, that just stays in the in the fluff? Because I, and I think that personally, I draw a lot of stuff from the fluff, and then I look at it and I go, hmm, what does that look like? And I make it my own in a way. So I have lots of little things that I do in my everyday life, in my scheduling, in my training, in my parenting that comes from fluff, but that I can tell you. So in this situation, I'll do this and this for this feedback or whatever so i have a lot of those things that are really important to me personally so so walk us through your thinking about absorbing some fluff i know you told me you listened to the growth mindset episodes recently Mm -hmm. how did how did how how did you find them and what and how did you what journey did you go on So when I was listening to those episodes, I and I haven't read the book, I must uh, say, uh, but I've listened to that those episodes and I, I've he- heard about the growth mindset in, in other podcasts as well. And I've been listening to it and I've been thinking about, so, okay, what does that mean to me? It has to do with how I um, handle failure or mistakes or things that I am unsure of. That was important to me to take a look at and maybe view back. And sometimes when I've thought that it is something else, it's still my view. It's it's my fear of failure, see me doing air quotes here, uh, that's been into play. And it made me think about how to uh, meet my teenager. My oldest son is now 18. He's stepping in. He just applied to university today, which was a big thing for the mother. Um And how to kind of, how do you navigate being a parent to an adult child? What does that look like? Thinking about it from what they, what they label a growth mindset. How can I help? And and why, and how does the growth mindset on what people love to call grit, how does that tie together? That's fascinating. Can tease that apart for a little bit. So I don't take off my glasses. I wouldn't say that, but I would say that I listen to it and then I start to like ask questions. And then sometimes my pet peeve and where I fall short is that if something happens has an explanation that rings false to me from a science perspective, then I get issues. Then I have issues. Um, Because it's one thing for me to sit and say, this has helped me, blah, 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 blah. I can say whatever from my own personal life. But to say that this works in this way, blah, blah, blah. And, um, or to say that, oh, positive reinforcement um, in, in the form of money doesn't work because blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, but pos- then that def- per definition, that's wrong. If you didn't get more behavior, it wasn't a positive reinforcer. And uh, we're now dying here. Uh, so, mm, um I had I had I had a, I had a lot of thoughts and I had I had the thoughts also that you said about bringing the book into ATA but I do think I think it's so valuable because if we can't talk about it, if we can't tease things out of it, we can't, I mean, how are we going to bring communities together and what are we, and who are we to say that we can't learn from something else, et cetera, et cetera. I had lots of thoughts. I had the thought also about don't say, don't say yes at once. If you make a request to me, I will most likely say, lovely, that's really, really interesting. I'll get back to you on Tuesday. And compare that to a system check in dog training. Somebody says, well, if you wanted to turn sharper on that front cross, drop your shoulder there and there, blah, blah, blah. And I'll say, lovely, I'll think about that and I'll talk to you (laughs) on Tuesday. And it's kind of the same thing, giving me the space. That came from fluff. That connection of me saying no or not giving a, a direct answer came from fluff. And that's helped me immensely for example. And so I know I'm, I'm, I'm completely passionate talking. I have like little post-it here of my favorite fluffy things. And, and, and there are so many things. I mean, there are reasons that there, there is a reason that there are proverbs because people make them into their own and it make it, make them work for them. Um, and everyone has their own path in, into how they're going to sort out their lives and why they want to sort out their lives. It might be they burnt themselves out or there might be illness in the family, whatever. But if they reach for a self-help book and they find things in the self-help book that actually helps them change their behavior, I am not going to uh, call that fluff and bad. I'm not going to be the person to, to do that, to call that judgment. Well, I think this uh, ties into 
conversations that have been happening in the Animal Training Academy podcast show as of late. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm thinking about at the time of this recording, which won't be in the order when it's released, um, our, the episode we released last, which was with uh, Laura Van Arendonk Bar. Did I Ball. say that correct? Bull. Um, about us versus them. About and, and, and I feel what you're saying is I'm interpreting it through my filters as developing curiosity. And then, and then I'm now thinking that that's just a behaviour for the listeners of this show to contemplate. What does curiosity look like? And what are the triggers, but I'm going to reframe that as cues. Mm-hmm. What are the behaviours that we want to intervene on? Ooh, ooh, thought. Go. Thought. Go. When you said cue, I was, I was just saying this the other day to whomever. Whenever I feel what we label frustrated or whenever my calendar backs up and I like, I want to, if I had a personal assistant, I would like to fire her. Um, that is a cue for me to reflect and go back and check. What can I do? What can I change? So talking about what you were just saying about your half an hour training, just tying back to that, the feeling of that there is a little something that should be a cue to change something. And that is not fluff. For sure, that's not fluff. That is what we say that we, that, that, that we do. That's, that's what we do. So I, I love that you, that, you, that you said that in, in this setting. Well, I, I use, I use uh, pauses and I catch myself. Going, thinking in the moment and using that as a cue to do a flow chart. I know that if I did a session and I had to stop and think at some point, like my brain's just going, okay, just stop the session now, Ryan, it's fine, do the scatter feed and go to a flow chart. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I just, as I was asked, as, as you were answering or, or adding your thoughts just then, I was like, oh my God, like I couldn't, I couldn't even listen to you talk about fluff without being like, <laughs> how does this look from a behavior lens? Like yes. I really struggle with it. Like I really, I, I really, am challenged to to not be to, to kind of absorb new information without it just like being pushed through the behavior funnel but don't and i don't i don't i don't think that's a necessarily bad and b good cool I, I don't i don't i don't think that we need to take the glasses off i just think that we don't need to we don't the glasses can't be tinted in the way that we deem stuff wrong that's phrased in a different way if 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 we that was one of my questions for you. Like, is there is there even any value in taking them off? Is, is it is it a bad thing? I don't, th- I don't think we can. Do, well, I, I, I find it very challenging. But what I'm curious about, follow and th- these are where my thoughts are going right now. Is if we did take them off, like let's say, like I was able to listen to you just then talk about your thoughts on fluff that mm-hmm. whatever we've been talking about have generated in the present moment, and I was like, okay, cool. I'm just gonna like not through that view that through a behavior lens. Like, would I end up with different information that could be equally valuable? Does or more valuable? Does that matter? Like, or so? We... How how does this tie into? Say that you're teaching a puppy class. You're teaching a puppy class, and it's new owners. Compared to you are teaching a puppy class with owners from ATA. The information and the way you divulge the information is going to be different depending on the group. Am I right? Does it make it any less? Does it make it wrong, or does it make it less valuable in any way? Because what you because it's like I don't think that there are other things. If we manage to take our glasses off, I don't think that there are other things. I think we would use other words to describe them, and we would say from our with with the glasses on. We would say that that's more labels and we might go into things that are more like circle around like um, Eric is, uh, is an angry child. How do we know that Eric's an angry child? Because he hits his sister. Why does Eric hit his sister? Because he's an angry child. And then we'll go around in those. I think that is one of the um, pitfalls of the fluff that sometimes we don't lift it up into what does that look like and kind of find the different behaviors under there. I think that's, and that's one of the reasons like when I have discussions with my friends, my closest friends do not work with behavior in any way. Uh, but we have fascinating discussions and then I'll be the one who says, well, what does, what does that look like? And who does what when or whatever. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and it's interesting to just watch their process coming in. But then on the other hand, I get stuff from them, questions that they are pondering and I'll go, okay, but that's interesting. Why are we pondering that? Just the same way that I get um, um, questions sometimes if we're discussing something, because it might be something where I have gone, you said before that it's like, when you look back, you're like, I don't know how I did it before. 
Well, to me, some of the stuff that people will bring me will be, I don't know why that is a problem. It's like, you did your best. We're all good. Someone will I mean, call me and cry about a training session. It's like, I don't know what training with You're always still happy. You might have made progress, but nobody died. I am. I, I mean, we're, we're all good. We're literally all good. You're going to go out next time and you're going to do better. What, do you need any help from me to be able to do better next time? I'm happy to give it to you. Let's point out, do you need to practice it? Do a couple of dry runs? Fine, do that. Go train. Everybody's happy. I, I think that the growth mindset I would operationalize into behaviors that I would like to fall under curiosity and exploration and grace. We're going to, I think, call this episode the pros and pitfalls of the fluff after <laughs> <laughs> you, you said that's one of the pitfalls of the fluff. I've always, throughout my life, I've engaged in the fluff. Mm-hmm. It's been a big part of my life. Uh, I've, I've um, always felt that if I can absorb some fluff, uh, and take one thing away from it that I will use for the rest of my life, and that was a good um, time spent with fluff. Mm-hmm. I've always thought that the goal of the fluff <laughs> for me is to increase my ability to put myself in someone else's shoes. And so I'm still curious, like, could I enhance that by taking off behavior glasses? I'm not saying I could. I'm not saying there's value in it. It's just I'm getting curious. I think that by engaging in, I think we need to stop calling it fluff because it feels like we're labeling it. Uh, it feels like we're putting it like in a corner, but nobody puts fluff in the corner. Dirty dancing references are everywhere. But I think that if we absorb fluff in many different ways, from our friends in conversation, from a podcast, from a book, we are going to get better and better at teasing out, okay, so what exactly what is, what was it in this? And how does that tie to this? And then how does this tie to this other thing that might be more tangible? And how do I unlabel it, unpack it and make it and make it into, and look at it, like make it into behavior, action points. How do I actually work with it? Because one of the things that we need to be able, for fluff to be interesting to me, then I need to be able to listen to it and use it, not just listen to it. And this is the reason why... I love magazines. So I that's that's my in my in road to the to the fluff are the magazines, the glossy magazines. Nobody would think that I love glossy magazines, but I love glossy magazines. And they're full of fluff. And most people will read that glossy magazine and go, oh, that's fascinating. Oh, that's fascinating. And then they'll do nothing with it. And I think for like with everything else, for the fluff to be useful, then you're gonna read that article and go, oh, oh, and you write it down on your phone or you take a little photo of it. And then the next time you're planning your week then perhaps you remember that Gretchen Rubin suggested in her podcast, Happier, that you can make a ta-da list, not just a to-do list. Oh, what is a ta-da list? Well, it's all the things that you made, that you got done during that week. And you sit down on your Friday afternoon at your desk and you make your ta-da list and you you remember back through the week. That will solidify some of the knowledge that you absorbed during that week. That will make it obvious to you that you actually got stuff done, even if you had a crappy Friday. Uh, You'll still remember that on Tuesday. Well, wow, I did send out that email and we got that conversation sorted and I signed that contract, whatever. And for me, then that fluff was completely worth it. It, it, There are a lot of things that I'm taking home from that. I love my Tadar list. I mean, I really do. And it's a label for sure. But what is the function of it? And what, what what can I derive from it? Isn't that the part that's interesting? So I have a lot of those. I have my Tadar list. I have the sentence that I repeat. And I think I've told you before, does my calendar reflect my uh, values? If I look at my calendar, and I color code it in like family time, Emily time, couple time, running time, training dog time, working time, does my calendar reflect my values? What does it look like? And if it, because that is for me, a very, very good way to nip overwhelm in the bud before it happens. And to also set realistic goals for myself. Sometimes I will have students that come to me and say, like, my goal is to compete in the World Cup in agility with my dog. And I'm like, great, let's look at your calendar. Um, because it's not that's not just a question of, of dog training and panda training. That's also a question of, are you making that kind of space in your life for that goal? That came from fluff, but it's completely operationalized and it's something that I use all the time. There's a Swedish professor in physics. Her name is Bode Lönsson. 
she wrote a book on time. It was called Tio tankar om tid, 10 thoughts about time. And she introduced the concept of stilltid, like time between. And I've definitely taken that concept on board going, going from one activity to the next, don't book them back to back. You need stilltid. You need time in between to shift between, not just to get it done, but to kind of have time to process what just happened and then step into the next thing. Uh, and I put that together with something that I read in some kind of business book that was what happens after a meeting. So everybody, people love meetings. They have meetings about everything. And it drives me insane when I go to council in the business world. I'm like, you just had a meeting about having a meeting for send an email people. Uh, but then what is a meeting? What do you do after a meeting? What are the action points? Who does what when, et cetera, et cetera. And that ties together with, with the stilted, with the time in between, making sure that people have time to reflect and gather up and go to the next thing and that they know what they're going to do, what, what was just discussed in that meeting. Otherwise, send an email. Don't bother me with that meeting, please. Um, I have pay myself first, which is very dear to my heart. And that has to do with time as well. When if you if you listen to books on um, or uh, podcasts on finances, personal finances, they will say that put money into your savings account first before you go around and start consuming things. And that way you're paying yourself first. I do that way with my time. I'll check my week and the Sunday, and I pay myself first. I book meetings. They are booked like meetings, but they might be with myself. That's nobody's business. I pay myself first. So all of this, all of this comes from Fluff, but it's completely operationalized and I use it to to uh, be nip, nip overwhelm in the bud before it happens. Your to-do list, does your calendar reflect your values? Pay yourself first. Mm-hmm. The pros and pitfalls of the Fluff, everyone. The listeners of this show, uh, if you, and I know many people do listen to every single episode, I am the bringer of fluff to uh, <laughs> this community. And, and I'm grateful. I'm so grateful. And I'm, I'm grateful for you to listen. I'm grateful for Emily for hanging out today and talking about this. I'm grateful that I have this space after five years to explore this contribution. Um, but I'm like you and I, and I seek and guess myself, is this, is this of value to people? Is this what they want? Uh, Emily, I value your opinion so highly and I'm, I'm so grateful that we got to dive into the fluff today. And most importantly, everyone, one reason I wanted to have this conversation is to smash down these us first them walls. They're not serving us, I believe. And mm-hmm. I think by engaging in, in conversations like this and, and, and reflecting on uh, where we are in 2021, uh, there there is value. Hopefully uh, there is for you as well the listeners of this show uh emily looking at the time let's let's wrap up here i think we never i never asked you and i'm sorry for not asking you to share uh, where people can go online to to find you to get in touch social media watch your pajama sessions can you share a little bit about that before we wrap up yeah sure so eva and i uh, our collaboration is carpe momentum and we're most active on facebook as carpe momentum we do have a web page as well as carpe momentum.nu so catch the moment now in swedish yeah uh on instagram i'm emily carpe and on facebook i'm emily johnson um and those pajama videos the sessions they are on instagram i post most of my training videos only on instagram i'm not a big fan of cross posting talking about the fluff and marketing and stuff, I am very sensitive myself to getting bombarded with the same things in many channels. So I try not to do that to people. So Emily Carpe on Instagram is where I'm most active, but you can find me on Facebook as well. And then on Carpe Momentum. Wonderful. And we will, of course, link to all of this in the show notes as well. Emily, this has been so much fun from myself and on behalf of everyone listening. uh, We really appreciate you hanging out with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. We do, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnest, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. That's it for this episode though. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much everyone for listening. You'll hear from us again soon.